If your organization is ready to enhance cyber resilience, we have important insights for you. The 2024 Level Blue Futures Report sheds light on how rapid computing changes affect IT visibility. Our research reveals that while IT leaders see positive outcomes, 85% acknowledge increased risk. In this report, we identify the barriers to cyber resilience, the challenges impacting cybersecurity, and the business contexts that reveal operational issues. You'll also discover what's on the horizon and five essential steps for prioritizing cyber resilience. Get your complimentary copy of this crucial research today. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash level blue. Cybersecurity simplified. Do your end users always, and I mean always, without exception, work on company-owned devices and IT-approved apps? I didn't think so. So my next question is, how do you keep your company's data safe when it's sitting on all those unmanaged apps and devices? 1Password has an answer to this question, Extended Access Management. 1Password Extended Access Management helps you secure every sign-in for every app on every device because it solves the problems traditional IAM and MDM can't touch. Check it out at securityweekly.com forward slash 1Password. Welcome back to Enterprise Security Weekly. Todd Tiemann joins us today to talk about Data Security Posture Management, or DSPM. Welcome to the show, Todd. Great to be here. Thanks for having me, Adrian. Now, you are a senior analyst over at uh, ESG, which is Enterprise Strategy Group. And uh, when, when it's been about a year, is that right? Yeah, it's about month nine for me. Um, okay. it just uh, I've, I, And I'm the, the analyst focused on data security as well as identity security or identity and access management at ESG. And, and my old coworker on this podcast is now your new coworker, correct? Tyler Shields is now in the seat. Correct. That, that's that's got to be fun. That's got to be a fun uh, some some fun meetings there. Uh, you guys and Melinda and um, it's it's a cool team. I I remember what it was like to to be in a close knit uh, analyst team like that. Uh, Wendy Nather and Javad Malik and Garrett Becker and all them. Uh, it was a good time. Yeah, I remember uh, your four, five, one days, and and indeed, it's a it's a nice uh, sort of I wouldn't say clash of views, but you know you have a good good chemistry right. there, like a lot of good back and forth as people are, argue over what's happening in cyberland. Yeah, and and you do want some variance in background there, right? Like like you, if you're not clashing at all, you're probably not diverse enough a team. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. It sort of makes you question what you're doing. Make sure it's well substantiated, and and it just get. People bring different perspectives to things, and it's, and it's good to uh, recognize that and appreciate that and, and use that. So it looks like you, you cover encryption, key management, IAM, identity security, security operations, and, and clearly data security, right? It's a big world, uh, although security operations, not so much. There's another analyst focused on that, although okay. I have a background from having worked in, in MDR land or MSSP land in the past, because my background is is product marketing and marketing and cybersecurity. I've been at that 20 plus years, but uh, um, it's more focused on, on everything, data security and identity security. And that's sort of what led me to do the research around DSPM. Okay. And... DSPM reminds me a lot of uh, a category that I covered um, uh, <laughs> that, that I'm, I'm going to promptly blank on, CASB. Uh, CASB, uh, I think, uh, from the first companies uh, really coming out of stealth to half of the field being acquired was something like two, two and a half years. And DSPM, uh, we're, we're actually in the news segment. We're going to talk about normalized getting getting snatched up uh, by Proofpoint, I believe. Uh, and that is number eight, uh, according to Mike Prevet, uh, who puts out the security funded newsletter. So, yeah, I, I mean, very exciting to cover those those kinds of categories. And, and kind of curious, uh, we early on we had several DSPM founders come on because we were having trouble trying to figure it out. And we could have done a briefing, but running a podcast, the easier thing is say, hey, founder, come on the show. Let us ask you a bunch of questions and just, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do the briefing live <laughs> and turn it into a podcast. Uh, so that that's what we did. And uh, yeah, just curious to hear your take on the market and, and where it's going. So I'll, I'll let you talk for a bit just to kind of set the stage. Yeah. So, so DSPM, as as you know, data security posture management is about uh, uh, 
discovering uh, where that your data is stored and uh, categorizing it. Uh, is that PII? Is that sensitive data? And this applies. Uh, DSPM grew up to a great degree in the cloud uh, infrastructure as a service and, and SaaS, but it's also reaching on prem at this point. Um, there has been a lot of that M&A activity normalized uh, with uh, 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 Proofpoint uh, last week, two weeks ago, um, before, you know, there's been various ones along the way where Rubrik bought Laminar and IBM way back, you know, a year ago or so bought Polar um, and others along the way. I think Tenable bought Eureka. Um, it's been really interesting to see the, the sort of uh, flux in the industry. Um, the research that we did uh, got published around mid-year. One of the questions we asked was when it came to data discovery, um, what would you prefer? Would you prefer a, a, uh, a, 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 actually this is for data resilience. Would you prefer a platform or would you prefer the best of breed with uh, integrations to adjacent areas? And um, the, the, the data came back that a one third said, give me a platform. And two thirds said, give me the best tool with integrations to adjacent areas. And I think some of that comes, you know, there's a, the perennial argument in the industry, is it platform, is it best of breed? Some of that in this space is it's a relatively new space. And so people want to make sure the stuff works. And so they're gravitating towards the best tool to solve that problem rather than a platform. Or the, a good third said, give me the platform. Um, that's probably going to change over time as, as, as things evolve. But that's wh where we are today is what, what the data, data says. Um, one of the other things, I'll make one other point and then I'll, 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 I'll shut up for a bit. Um, one of the other points that, that's interesting is with all this ferment in, in acquisitions and mer that happening in the industry, it, you have some folks that are, are um, uh, folding it into what they already do. Like, um, I, I forget who it was about Eureka. Was it Tenable? I think. And they're basically saying this is... CNAP. They're not even referring to, to, to DSPM so much, if I recall correctly, whereas others are, are adding that functionality into what they already do. So for, for Rubrik, um, yeah, yeah, you can, uh, it's tenable. Uh, you can, you know, discover, classify your data and it, that's going to, that's going to augment and uh, help them uh, back up, restore, you know, make sure that data is protected is, is the thinking. And then you have some pure plays out there like uh, Sierra, where they're saying we do uh, this, but also they just acquired an Israeli startup, startup trail security for DLP. So it's more of a, a bigger uh, data security play that combines DLP and DLP. SPM. This is some, something similar to what you saw with, with uh, Proofpoint, where they had DLP, and now they're layering on DSPM with that normalized acquisition. I, I guess my next natural question is, what's the difference? That was going to be my question, too. Right? Like, 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 isn't DSPM just DLP, like the next generation of DLP, or...? There, I, I, I'm, I'm still figuring out, uh, and, and uh, my mind is, is uh, where my head is at, at right now is, if you look at DSPM, it's more data at rest focused. Um, okay. So it's discovering, categorizing, uh, so you can uh, make sure the posture of that data is right. If there's stale access to it, get rid of it. Uh, if you need to harden the data, do that. You know, if it's an open S3 bucket, okay, let God take care of that. Whereas DLP is more data in motion, you want to stop from going out the door. So that that's one of the nuances there. I've heard some folks uh, say, well, DSPM is more uh, machine generated data that's feeding your applications, whereas as, as DLP is more unstructured data. But the counterpoint to that is, well, you could just take that that uh, machine generated data and download it to a spreadsheet, and and the, so where right. where does DSPM stop and DLP start? The best right. I've and I've it, seen, and that will happen. D data is messy like that. Yeah, the the best I've seen is is that uh, it's it's basically uh, at rest versus in motion. Gotcha, and it, it does seem somewhat um, left of boom versus right of boom. DSPM is something you you would do in in preparation. You know, make sure all the data is where it should be, understand your environment. Whereas uh, the L in DLP, you know, in, in implies that you're trying to detect an incident. Yep, true. And that that's true. And the people using it within the enterprise, it's typically, you know, different constituents that are involved in, in DLP versus DSPM. Does that create any 
any sort of misalignment within the security team. Because if you have different people looking at data from different perspectives and not necessarily on the same page, it, it feels like there could be a lot of problems with figuring out an overall strategy because at the end of the day, it needs to be one common goal. That indeed, uh, it, it's a really good point um, because when it comes to DSPM, you're crossing multiple functions within any enterprise. There's the, the data security folks over there that want to make sure data is secure. There's the data protection folks that want to make sure it's backed up and restored and, and they have visibility to everything. Uh, and so making sure there's no, no sort of shadow IT that's happening. Uh, then you also have the data governance folks. So DSPM touches on a bunch of different constituents. I think there's the risk of, of some friction there, internal friction, uh, where I've seen successful teams navigating that is upfront having a kickoff and to, before, uh, during your DSPM deployment to understand, okay, what's in scope? How do we categorize stuff? Uh, getting the constituents at the table and getting executive buy-in for, for that DSPM project to, to minimize that sort of um, uh, potential friction between organizational functions. So what you're explaining screams to me of a bigger team, right? You've got a team that has multiple people different for various functionalities. What happens when you're dealing with a much smaller organization? You know, a thousand person organization still has data challenges, but they're probably not going to have that, um, that granular level of security and, and data protection within their team. Yeah, that's true. And and you do have uh, sort of those sort of mid-market or small enterprises, they're actually going to town. And, and then the constituents at the table, it's fewer, but it's typically more than just security, uh, just security, because you do need to have the, the IT folks there um, that are doing the backup and restore. And there's also governance implications that may, might be an IT function. It's not necessarily a committee, but you need to make sure those constituents are there um, and uh, have a common understanding of, of what you're looking to achieve and also have buy-in from, from the right exec to make sure this, this is a priority. One of the things we did find in, in the research we did was the topic was around data resilience, which is sort of the intersection of DSPM and security and governance and, and protection, data protection. And it was a when, when asked what sort of a priority this is, it was a top five priority for like 80% of the, of the respondents, and it was a top priority for 20 plus percent of the respondents. And I think some of that comes from ransomware attacks where the time to recover has been painful. Um, but any C CIO or CISO, as, as, as you know, they only have the cycles on their team to, to undertake three, maybe four or five projects per year. Um, and what this research was saying is this is absolutely one of those those projects. We need to make sure uh, we're resilient in in, in, in the, the face of adversity. Yeah, and I, I think that makes the laminar acquisition into rubric very interesting, right? You know, because uh, now they kind of have that that whole piece put together uh, since rubric uh, started out on backup and, and heavily focuses in that area. No, no, indeed. I was I was actually listening in on their their financial results for the last quarter, and they were mentioning three things, and I forget what no, number one and number three were, but I think number two, or maybe it was number three, was DSPM that they had, uh, you know, s significant adoption, and they're 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 seeing uh, uh, there's some buzz around that within within that organization is what they they said uh, in their financial results. Yeah, and, and and then you've got uh, you know how how big of a use case is preparing for using AI internally here because that's you know I I do a lot of advisory calls on on AI and it's it's very clear that uh, something like a Microsoft Copilot is kind of shining a spotlight on data hygiene and governance issues uh, so a lot of people are either using the Copilot uh, to discover those. Uh, or trying to tackle it in flight because the business is really pushing them to, you know, put something like AWS Bedrock, you know, wh whatever the tool might be, Glean. You know, I've seen a lot of people, is it Glean or Gleam? I, I forget, but you know, I've seen a lot of that where it's just going to consume all your data. And that data is a hot mess. Uh, I was on the call 
uh, with a uh, with a client once, uh, explaining to them the importance of adversarial prompting. Uh, you know, ask it questions you don't want it to have the answer to. And while we're on the on this uh, Zoom call, uh, the one of the guys searches uh, says, "Show me passwords." And sure enough, it finds a file with clear text passwords in it and and shows it to him uh, that it found on SharePoint. Um, you know, so are, are are you seeing that as a big use case for DSPM? You had to drop that generative AI buzzword, didn't you? You know, we we, we need to have that included it's, it's in. It's all. Um, it's not my fault. Uh, <laughs> so, so we actually asked that question. You know, what's what's uh, your primary concern uh, around this? And number one was, I want to stop a data breach. I want to avoid a data breach, and I, so I need to understand where my data is, make sure the posture is yep. good. The uh, number two was facilitating generative AI deployments. And as as uh, we all know, uh, security for Gen AI is a many layered cake. Uh, but you need to make sure you're informing the raw models with the right data, not inadvertently feeding it PII or sensitive data that, that might leak out. Um, uh, and one example I, I know of was there's a, a large U.S. enterprise deploying Microsoft Copilot, and this is uh, along the lines of, of what, you, what you were describing. And one of their, their IT workers plugged in their name to see what would happen. And what do you know? They were on a layoff list. And... Um, yeah, that that's not a, a, a that's a data leakage problem. But the root of that was in inappropriate or inadequate or non-existent data classification of what was feeding into the model, um, and that's where DSPM can help is is locating classifying that data that might be feeding into that Gen AI infrastructure, so you avoid and control against situations like that. Now, jumping back to uh, all the acquisitions we've seen in this area, you know, I hear you saying that two thirds want best of breed, not platform. You know, but I see eight of these companies acquired, and I wonder is is, is that dichotomy a false choice? You know, I'm always seeing. Uh, it seems like once a week I see a CISO. I'm in a bunch of slacks with a bunch of security leaders. And I see them lamenting the acquisition of one of their favorite best of breed products to be consumed into a platform. So, like, how how do you how do you buy best of breed, not knowing uh, if if they intend to uh, sell into uh, the you know Prisma or you know whatever the platform might be. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. My crystal ball gets kind of cloudy in terms of what all is going to happen here. I think if the, the total addressable market significant enough, you know, pure plays are going to do OK. If it's not significant enough, then th th they might be some some mm. struggles there. I, I think uh, CISOs and security teams need to, to figure out you know, what are their priorities? Uh, look at the options that might be available. Uh, and uh, there's a certain business risk that your favorite vendor might get acquired. Um, but that's, that's uh, I don't know much that can be done to control against that other than as part of the acquisition process, you know, making sure this is a good viable uh, uh, startup, uh, well-funded and has, has a good path to, to into the future. And to quote one of them in a conversation I was having earlier today about the normalized acquisition, uh, DSPM is a feature, not a product. And I, I responded, uh, a feature of what? Uh, and he, frustratingly, uh, this person responded, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think there's there's some folks like uh, Sayera that, that are going down the data protection path saying, you know, two sides of the same coin, we're going to do uh, the, the DSPM and DLP as, as one solution. So that's, that's yeah. you know, one approach to it. More um, of a set that, that, that was what I was going to say. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I thought, yeah, well, and, and we talked about the rubric example, right? You know, which is kind of in a different direction. You know, that that's more in the resiliency side of things. So, yeah, I, I guess maybe yes does make sense, right? Like, like everybody kind of needs to understand the data, right? Every, Absolutely. Every side of security. Yeah. Absolutely. You need you need to know, you know, where that sensitive data is. And uh, it could be out of scope of IT, that 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 shadow data that IT didn't have visibility to uh, that needs to have visibility to. And it's not a one and done when it comes to DSPM, because that landscape, the, the data the enterprise is using is always in flux and it's changing yeah. um, and it needs to be managed and, and rationalized on an ongoing basis. 
Do you have a sense for so so traditionally DLP is infamous uh, for bad data classification? You know, for it, it's a you know of course started out with very rudimentary methods, and now we've moved into machine learning models. We're probably not doing regex as much anymore. Um, but uh, yeah, even doing Lun's algorithm, you know, when I was a PCI QSA, uh, there was a, uh, a custom tool. I actually found somebody to help develop a custom tool for me to make it less and less false positive prone because even uh, using Mod 10, like you would still get tons and tons and tons of, of uh, uh, false positives. Uh, do you have a sense for like how big of a leap technologically we've made in the ability uh, of the classification part of the technology? Uh, to to be accurate and and not flood folks with uh, false positives that they have to dig through. I think that's one of the ways uh, that that the DSPM players try to differentiate themselves. I haven't heard of a significant issue around false positives, and I recall being at the RSA conference at the the uh, uh, innovation showcase where you had bedrock security, one of their uh, differentiators was we provide a bunch of context around that data. It's not a simple, it's not regex, it's beyond that. And uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, net, net it out, I have not heard of the false positive issue being uh, a significant problem for those folks deploying DSPM. Now, I might not be talking to the right folks. Uh, I didn't ask that question actually in the research that, that we, we published. Uh, great question to ask. Uh, we did quite ask, you know, how many of you are, are uh, planning or deploying DSPM? And there's, there's a wave hitting right now of people that are evaluating in POC or planning to deploy in the next 18 months, two years. Um, but I haven't heard of uh, significant issues around uh, the false positives. Um, well, that's, that's good. That's, uh, I mean, certainly something that we need to hear. You know, when I was an analyst, um, I often said, uh, data security would be the last frontier because it's so hard to put controls around it. It, it needs to be fluid and flexible to be useful to the business. Uh, I, I've seen tools in the past where, you know, I try and send somebody a, uh, a pen test report, you know, and I get to encrypt it with this thing and then tell them, oh, you got to download and install the software. Once you have the software installed, you know, here's the passphrase, here's the key to uh, unlock the data in that file. And it's, uh, you know, th those kinds of workflows are so painful because they didn't pick up the phone. So I'm leaving them, this is a message on their voicemail that I'm leaving them uh, with, a, with a password. And, uh I'm not. I'm not sure how much better it is today, uh, and, and of course, that's slightly different use case. But just the the hygiene uh, governance piece, uh, you know, I, I think maybe it got a little bit better when we got off of Windows file servers and went to Google Drive and OneDrive and stuff like that. You know, at least it's not default. Everybody gets access to everything, but um, but yeah, still dumping ground for everything, right? Yeah, I, I know, you know from from a past life, uh, the false positives are the bane of existence for SOC, uh, SOC uh, pr uh, practitioners. Um, I haven't heard of that sort of problem with with the, the DSPM. I'm going to be super interested. At all every solution sort of applying Gen AI to what they're doing. I'm going to be yeah. super interested in in how Gen AI is going to uh, subtract from or add to that that noise problem. Given hallucinations, yeah. given uh, that it's probabilistic, it's going to be super interesting to see uh, how how that all pans out. But that's it's not my be. area of, of research. It's going to be generating data and then training on the data that it generated. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, per perhaps some of that is that, as you point out, uh, this is machine generated data, not not nearly as chaotic as employee generated data, uh, which like I, I remember the analyzing the Sony breach, uh, the Sony Pictures breach way back. And one of the big stories that came out of that was uh, – the uh, disparity between pay for women and men at Deloitte, right? Like this is a Sony Pictures breach. How did Deloitte uh, salary information end up there? I think the story was somebody from Deloitte HR moved over to Sony Pictures, brought some files with them. And, uh, you know, they had this huge spreadsheet of all these Deloitte employees and uh, whose salary was what. And, and that was, you know, part of what North Korea leaked when they, when they hacked Sony Pictures. 
Funny. Yeah, rewinding to, to, to the, the topic we just mentioned about false positives, one, it relates to something that, that I, I uh, found in this research around data resilience, because we asked about DSPM, how do you go about uh, uh, discovering classifying data? Uh, are you using simply metadata uh, to do that? And like 20% of the people said, yeah, metadata. Then you had 50% that said metadata plus a sampling of the data. And then you had like 20, 30% that said metadata plus a full scan of the data. And uh, what that said to me is number one, people are pretty rigorous when it comes to, to, to data discovery classification, how they're doing it. But the fact that like 20, 30 percent or it was like on the verge of 30 percent said I do looked at metadata and then did a full scan of the data, which costs money in a, in a cloud. Uh, you know, you're using up a, a bunch of CPU and you're going to run up a bill. But what that said is they're they're very rigorous about it, but there might be compliance drivers uh, that, that are motivating the, them to do that. Because if they sample and they inadvertently miss, or, or as a result of sampling, miss some PII and end up with a privacy uh, problem, a violation, a compliance issue, that, that's bad news. So they're willing to incur the cost to do a full scan in addition to using metadata to make sure they understand thoroughly what's in a given data store. And that, that was one of the things that was, that was interesting for me. When, I, when I've talked to with some of the DSPM vendors about that, they go, wow, that, that is higher than, than I would have anticipated. Uh, this is all very interesting because, you know, we've been talking about DSPM for a little bit. It's still kind of an unknown quantity. And, and I am interested to see where it goes because we've had so many stops and starts with other data security related products. So um, not sure I have a question, but I, I'm very interested to see what you're going to be writing and talking about. Again, let me think, mention one thing I just, in looking at the data that came to light uh, uh, about this was people, about uh, one third of the folks out there have sort of a homegrown tool to do data discovery and like 40% use a commercial off the shelf tool to do data discovery. And then the remainder might use some manual processor. You know, they didn't know what, what, how they do it. But what struck me was that one third that used a homegrown tool. And when I talked to CISOs and, and uh, about this and security practitioners about it, a lot of those homegrown tools grew up sort of focused on on-prem infrastructure. And now folks are having to wrestle with on-prem and cloud, how are they gonna do this? Uh, and what, that's where DSPM comes in, where it grew up in the cloud and now it's adding in the on-prem. So you're finding, uh, I'm anticipating, this is me crystal balling, I'd anticipate that a lot of those homegrown tools that were uh, grew up for on-prem are gonna be superseded by DSPM or uh, commercial tools that can do both. And one of the things that the research came across was, for those folks that had a, a shortage of, of uh, data resilient skills, so they were resource constrained internally when they're people, they uh, gravitated towards the commercial off the shelf stuff rather than the homegrown stuff. And I think that what, what was happening there is they have resource constraints. They don't want to develop and test and maintain an on-prem tool. Let me buy something off the shelf to solve this problem. That's what, that's what uh, the, the, this research was uh, indicating. You know, it, you know, I wonder, you know, talking about DSPM, uh, at least from what you're seeing, being mostly focused on, uh, you know, being, I, I think we talked about it being more like the CSPM to the SSPM, you know, focused on, on uh, you know, the, the workloads, uh, server workloads, cloud workloads, uh, your, your DevOps workloads, rather than employee facing stuff or employee generated stuff. So I wonder, is that a separate category? Companies like... Uh, I've noticed there's a few that are throwing AI around because they're they're mostly they're not doing anything with AI or AI governance, but they're focused more on the data problem that AI has created. Like uh, Zen Data is is one example of that. Uh, I've got a few in my my notes here where I kind of track the the market here. Um, <clears throat> I'm not I sure. think that, that sounds like data governance, <laughs> if I recall correctly. Yeah, um, yeah. 
And I, and I think it's sort of it overlaps uh, with with DSPM, uh, but uh, but I think they're discrete categories. Uh, whereas DSPM has a security focus, and uh, others might be more more governance focused. Yeah, Redactive was another one, uh, which apparently right now just produces a report uh, that analyzes user permissions. Which is valuable because you might have, you know, user permissions, they might be stale and you want to you want to uh, revoke that. Uh, but uh, there's it, it, there's a lot of uh, uh, challenges in terms of adding in all the different data stores that you need to, to look at. And I think that's that's one of the things that the DSPM players have been adding in uh, over the months and years is the ability to uh, to understand data stores from infrastructure as a service to SaaS to to on prem also. So you can do your your Salesforce, you can do you know, different things. And it's, it's certainly a you know frustration that I'm hearing from folks is, uh, you know, when they're using Copilot and trying to solve that data, uh, that data mess, that problem. Uh, Microsoft is telling them to use data labeling and purview. And, uh, you know, they, they look at the amount of data they have and they're like, how the heck am I supposed to apply labels at the file level? I have millions of files across, you know, tens of thousands of employees. Like, like that's got to be an automated tool that, that does that. That's not something like maybe you can label stuff at, as it goes through work workflows, you know, just because the data is being produced by an application or a process, you can apply a label to it. And we've, we've seen that done in, in the cloud with workloads and AWS and Azure and things like that. But, uh, but yeah, it seems like there, there's still a big problem there with uh, employee facing data. And I've, I've heard of some DSPM vendors being deployed to do that labeling because to to that yeah. point purview was not able to to cut it for them so it's a, a interesting intersection of uh, dlp and dspm where that labeling is happening through the, the dspm solution well as we wrap up this conversation todd uh tell us a little bit about uh what kind of research you've published on this and where we can find it so the research is available on uh, ESG, uh, uh, the internal uh, our, our research portal. So you can go to ESG.com. There are a number of uh, vendors out there. I know Normalize has uh, pieces of this. You can go to their uh, website. There's actually, I don't know how quickly it's going to turn from Normalize to Proofpoint, but they have a, a, a nice piece around uh, the steps necessary to implement DSP, which is very prescriptive in terms of here's your typical 16 steps along the way to uh, deploy a DSPM solution. That's something uh, that's available there. Um, so th those are some of the places you can find this. And there's various blogs that I've put out uh, uh, that, that, that touch on some of the research. So if you Google up ESG, Todd Tiemann, uh, and DSPM, Boom. You're going to see a bunch of uh, different blogs that have uh, some of this data. Excellent. Well, thank you again for joining us, uh, Todd, to have this conversation. Uh, I, I learned a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks, Katie. Good to see you again. I hope our audience learned a lot, too. Uh, stick around. We'll be right back in a few moments with the weekly enterprise news. 